Welcome to Around the Paul. I'm Garrett Mitchell, joined as always by Griffin Barfield and Clifton Kennedy. And we have a very special guest here with us tonight, Scott Medlin from the Section 17 podcast and DukeFootballTalk.com. And gentlemen, it is game week. We've waited almost 10 long months uh, for this time to roll around. And six days from now on Labor Day Monday, the Clemson Tigers and the Duke Blue Devils They'll be squaring off at Wallace Wade Stadium in Durham, North Carolina. So we're here to talk uh, the big game coming up, prime time, 8 p.m. ESPN, and we've all been waiting for it. So, Scott, you're our guest. Uh, again, we just appreciate you coming on and uh, giving us some perspective from the Duke side of things. And we're just going to let you have the floor right from the get-go. Tell us, what's the prevailing thoughts and the sentiments uh, per, uh, you know, percolating through Durham right now and how does the Duke football program feel? What are the fans thinking? And what's the overall mood as we get ready for Labor Day Monday night? Well, appreciate you guys having me on. Uh, we definitely appreciate that. I, I'm telling you right now, this is the biggest feel for an opening football game in Duke football history, as far as I can tell, in my uh, short 47 years. Uh, it's, it's just the, the atmosphere, the people are ready. We Ever since Coach Elko got signed on back in December of, what, 21? Uh, the, the, everything's been just different. The, the feeling, the fan base, they're all excited. They're ready. Uh, we had a meet and greet a couple Sundays ago if, at, during, a, we had a practice meet and greet afterwards. And for Duke, thousands of people were there. That's not something you typically see for Duke football. So it's the last two seasons, mm -hmm. you know, the atmosphere has been different. Uh, and like, you know, we were joking a few minutes ago before we got online, I'm telling you, it, it, having it's a blessing and curse being the last game, but it's exciting because I do believe that this is a great opportunity for, I think, two great teams. I know Clemson's obviously great, but I do think Duke has an opportunity. Now, I'm not going to say they're going to win, but I do think they have a chance <laughs> to be on national television to display some of the things that people don't know about them. Uh, Riley Leonard and a couple of the other players that are there. And – I think it's a good opportunity. I mean, this obviously Duke's schedule this season has ramped up considerably from last year. And the fact that they had won nine games and they were 16 points away from being undefeated is amazing. So coming back into this season, they've only lost, I think, five or six players total. So 18 of the 22 that started last year are back. So that's a great thing to have um, anywhere. I mean, it doesn't matter who you are. And – with Riley Leonard now with basically driving the key, having the keys to the car, I think it's a great thing for Duke and uh, it's a great opportunity for Duke to put maybe maybe not put on a show but be able to go toe to toe with Clemson, shall we say? Right, you're absolutely right. And you know one thing that I find intriguing about this game is that Duke does, as you said, they return so much offensively. Quarter it starts with quarterback Riley Leonard. And you've got Wes Goodwin, the defensive coordinator for Clemson. He's entering his second year. And it was a Clemson defense that at times struggled last year. And you could point to any number of reasons. And I think part of that was predicated on the fact that the offense just kept them on the field for long periods of time. But that said, people were really wondering what kind of adjustments uh, Coach Goodwin is going to make in his second year at the helm of the defense. And he's got a big test coming right out of the gate against uh, Leonard and the rest of this Duke offense. And so, Scott, you know, where do you think Duke tries to attack right there? And who are some of those supplementary guys around Leonard that Goodwin's going to have to account for and that Clemson fans should be uh, mindful to watch come Monday night? Well, there, I would say this the offensive line has been unbelievable for the last two seasons for Duke. And there's a uh, one of the guards – had a season engine season ending injury last year. And it was to the point when we came out of spring ball, we, we were not sure he would ever play again mm -hmm. and he's back on the field and going to start. And that's a great thing because the O-line got Graham Barton, who's a potential number one draft pick, Jacob Monk, who has a potential to be a second or third round guy, along with a couple other pieces of the puzzle that we've had. But as far as key players, Duke has a, a massive, like a four-headed yeah. monster in the backfield. They've got uh, Waters. They've got Coleman. Uh, they have a true freshman that just came in this uh, last spring, Peyton Jones. And they've got 
that room is great for them. And they've got five or six guys. They've got guys that are probably not even going to play this season. They're really good, high uh, athletes. But to me, the three biggest uh, keys on the offensive end for Duke would be Jalen Calhoun, who's a senior, Jordan Moore, who was in the battle with Riley Leonard last year going into preseason camp for QB, now has had a full offseason to be a wide receiver, and Samir Hagens. Samir Hagens, towards the end of the season last year, showed flashes of brilliance. And to me, you know, those are probably three of the fastest Duke receivers I think we've seen in a long time. Well, and, um, you know, let's talk a little bit about from the Clemson perspective. And uh, we're like the Knights of the round table. We'll just uh, – we'll go around in a circle. But, Griffin, um, you know, I want to pitch this one to you. When you look at Duke and Scott hit the nail on the head, Duke uh, has been very good up front on the offensive line. But they do lose some production there uh, from last year coming into this year, I believe a little over 50% according to my notes here. And Clemson, meanwhile, they returned 75% of their production on the defensive line. So, Griffin, how do you feel about uh, – or where does that come into play? And do you does that tip the scales at all in Clemson's favor, at least on paper? And, uh, you know, where does that matchup go from that perspective? I mean, it most definitely could. But I think that with both sides – getting healthy. Um, Scott, like you said, that offensive lineman uh, is coming back as well. But Clemson has guys in the defensive line that are coming back as well. Guys like Xavier Thomas, you know, Justin Maskell as well. And, you know, maybe you could potentially see, you know, this defensive line breakthrough. But like Scott said, and like I'm sure any fan has seen when you look at the Duke offensive line is that they are just resilient. And I'm sure that you can just describe this whole Duke team as, as resilient because that just comes with experience. So could I see it being a factor? I see it being an X factor. I most likely, I I definitely could. But um, I think that this Duke line could just be very resilient, that it just might be very hard to allow those plays like a sack. Right, and Clifton, uh, you you know, you look at the experience that's coming back for the defensive line for uh, for the Tigers. You've got Tyler Davis, who's back for a fourth year, uh, who I don't think anybody really expected to, to forego the NFL draft and come back. So that was certainly a surprise. And then you've got Xavier Thomas, uh, who was just this heralded five-star recruit coming in in 2018, has never been able to shake the injury bug, though he's shown flashes of just how brilliant he can be. And he's back for a sixth year. How often do you see or can say that a sixth year senior at defensive end? And he looks like he's finally healthy. So when you couple that experience with the talent that Clemson has up front on defense, how much of a factor does that become? Man, I think that's a I think that's a big factor in this game. Um, One of the things that um, I'm curious about is if Xavier Thomas, Xavier Thomas can get back to his old ways. And like he was this uh, sophomore freshman, um, you know, <clears throat> and this being his, he, I think he said, you said six year. Um, I mean, if it, we asked him in an interview if he ever thought of himself being here six years and he said, no, I was three and gone. And so, but he also said that was, that was my plan, not God's plan. So, um, so yeah, but one person you forgot was Rook. Yes, um, Rook, Rook, Rook. Um, I mean, him and uh, Tyler Davis, you know, nobody thought they were going to come back, you know, like you were talking about, and they did. And and then you got um, Sheridan Jones on the on the back end, um, who, if I'm not mistaken, he's roommates with both of them, and he said when, when he found out they were coming back, he was coming back. So, um, and I think he's got something to prove. So, um, I think our defense has a lot to prove, um, and we have, um, you know, 75% of the defensive line back, which is insane. And um, and then, you know, we have a, a lot of our defensive, defensive backs back. So I think that defense is going to be something um, that Duke's going to have to contend with a lot. Um, but I'm cu- really curious, and I know we're probably going to talk about this, but I'm going to go ahead and bring it up is uh, the Clemson offense, you know, with the new offensive line. I meant new offensive coordinator and um, uh, Riley, um, you know, Garrett Riley. I think that uh, – I think there's a lot of unknowns, but there's there's not a lot of unknowns, if that makes any sense at all. Yeah. I mean, you know what he's done in the past, but you don't know what he's going to do with these Clemson players. 
Um, and the wide receiver group, you know, I mean, they're unproven, if you ask me, from the past two years. They haven't done anything. And um, I want to see if they can step up and uh, be that force, get back to that wide receiver you, you know, or at least show tendencies, at least show streaks of that, you know. Right, and Scott, you've talked about the Duke offense, and certainly everybody knows coming in that it's uh, it's an experienced unit. It's It can be very potent, put a lot of points on the board. So it is a big test for the Clemson defense coming right out of the gate. But talk to us a little bit about the Duke defense and one particular matchup that I've personally had my eye on is the Duke secondary against the Clemson receivers because when you look size-wise, it would appear that Clemson has a, a bit of a height advantage over the uh, over the Blue Devils secondary uh, with guys like Adam Randall who are six three, Bo Collins at six four, the six foot six tight end Jake Brenningstool. So the Duke secondary, at least uh, to the eye test, it, they may be a bit undersized by comparison. But the all of the word that we've heard is that these guys are just tremendous covering in space, and they've got great ball skills. So can you elaborate on that matchup just from the Duke perspective? Well, it's worked out that Duke has had three transfers come in this past offseason. Uh, Al Blades from Miami, uh, Miles Jones from Texas A&M, who actually didn't play a snap, I don't think, at all last season. And then Jeremiah Lewis, who was at Northwestern, who left Duke to for, left Duke to for Northwestern, Northwestern for Duke. And now he's – I think he's in his sixth year, um, has come back and is going to play a little bit of safety for uh, Duke. Miles Jones is a big guy. Blades is a big guy. Other than that, though, Joshua Pickett, Chandler Rivers, Bob, Brandon Johnson, those guys are not big, but they are able to cover a lot of space. So, yeah, I do see that possibly being something that Clemson would try to exploit, trying to get the smaller guy with the bigger receiver tight end. I mean, the, your, your tight end there is probably bigger than – two of our offensive linemen, to be honest with you, because that's that's just kind of what you guys do. That's how you recruit them. Right. And uh, Griffin, you know, talking about the tight end and Brenning Stool, he's such a weapon. And we saw flashes of that once he started being fed the ball toward the end of last season. But he's such a versatile guy. Six six, he he can play tight. He lines up a tight end. He can play the position, but he can also go out wide and catch passes too. So really it's a matchup nightmare that I don't think was utilized enough last year under Brandon Streeter as the offensive coordinator. And Garrett Riley has publicly stated in uh, multiple press conferences that one of his goals is to open up the tight end game more and to get Brenning stool, the ball and take advantage of the weapon that he is. So, when you look at the matchups going into Monday, how involved do you see Brenning Stool being in the offense coming right out of the gate? I see him being a red zone threat right off the cut. And if anybody can get Brenning Stool open or get him on a mismatch to maybe one of those smaller guys, it is 100% Garrett Riley. And like you said, Garrett, he is athletic. He can, you know, do whatever he can to run that bunch to get that mismatch. And frankly, I do see him getting a touchdown. I think that if I had to guarantee one Clemson receiver to get a touchdown, I think it'd be Burning Stool. I think he is the perfect guy to find in the end zone. I think just because of the height advantage, the frame, um, being six foot seven, I think I just think that he's bound to have a big game. And with, especially with the mis mismatch and the new offensive coordinator with Riley, I think Jake Burning Stool is just bound to stand out on Monday. And Clifton, uh, Scott touched very well on the Duke running back stable, uh, four capable backs, and uh, there's obviously a lot of depth and talent in that position. But uh, talk some about – let's talk about the Clemson running backs, and you've got a tremendous duo uh, that's yeah. been much ballyhooed uh, uh, coming into the season, and Will Shipley and Phil Moffa. And, uh, you know, a lot of people prognosticating that uh, this is one of the more talented duos in the country. So where do they factor into this game? And – um, you know, Scott, uh, just piggyback uh, after Clifton finishes his thoughts uh, on how Duke can counter uh, the tandem of Shipley and Moffat. Yeah, so um, <clears throat> I think I think they're two of the best backs in the nation, um, and I think I think that uh, Shipley and Moffat could you could see if they're both on their game this year. I think you could see some shades of thunder and lightning. 
from uh, 09, 08, you know, all those years. Um, and um, I really think that both of them guys together, um, that you could see maybe Shipley, uh, you're going to see a, a heavy dose of Shipley, I think, on the inside maybe, and, and to the outside. Who knows? He's just so versatile. And uh, and then you got the br really the bruiser, I think, in in um, Mafa. I mean, that guy can just hit somebody and just go. And um, so, and then don't don't um, overlook Dominique Thomas in third string. I know a lot of people aren't talking about him, but um, he made third string. Like he's a third string back, and he w had a huge, huge spring game. And I don't know how much you can really put on the spring game, but um, he did have a big spring game. And um, so I wouldn't be surprised if both of those guys get gassed at some point or another that you don't see Dominique Thomas in there at some point. So, um, but yeah, man, I think our backs are, are, you know, two of the best um, and um, definitely going to be something that the Duke defense needs to watch out for. So. Yeah, I would I would say that um and and this is no no me trying to down Duke at all. The one place that they may hurt the most as far as experience would be tight I'm not tight end, linebackers. Mm -hmm. Uh two starting linebackers is Cam Dillon, who's a transfer who had a great season last year. And it's either gonna be number eight, Dorian Musi, or Trey Freeman, who are both young guys. And then the fourth mm -hmm. linebacker is Nick Morris, who's a younger guy also. So as far as that part, that, that is going to be a weakness, I think, for Duke that could potentially be something Garrett Riley could take care of. Mm -hmm. I would say as far as uh, towards the end of the season last year, Duke had Darius Joyner, who was a transfer that came in. And he basically played the bandit position. And he was at the line of scrimmage on every snap. As the season progressed, Brandon Johnson, who will be number three, you'll see a lot of Brandon Johnson. That kid is everywhere. He, you will probably see him on the line of scrimmage, uh, blitzing or spying maybe, uh, something along those lines, I do believe. But I think that, you know, I, I've said it, we said it on the, our podcast, those two guys are bruisers. I mean, you get two different it, – it's like two different cars. you got the sports car. And then you got the big SUV and it's like, you know, which one do you drive? And I, that would be great to have in a backfield for anybody. I mean, NFL teams would love to have that. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. And, you know, I think something that doesn't need to be overlooked in this game, something that needs to be touched on as experienced as both teams are in a lot of places. And I think, um, and Scott, you'll have to elaborate on um, how much this could apply to Duke, but, one thing for Clemson is it's not just the uh, the experience and the guys who have been around for a long time, but how much does uh, do the young freshmen uh, factor into this game and contribute into this game? Because Clemson had uh, – it's really one of the more heralded uh, – for a program known for its defense, especially under Brent Venables, it's one of the more heralded fr uh, defensive freshman classes we've had come in at, uh, in a long time. And it starts with Peter Woods, who was the number five overall prospect in the country – uh, who just all throughout spring and into fall camp, uh, everybody says has just dominated uh, everybody he's gone up against. But then you've got guys like defensive end T.J. Parker, uh, Stefflin Green on the defensive line. So these are some young plug-and-play guys as well that provide depth that I think we're going to see early. So, um, you know, how uh, guys, how do they factor into this game? And conversely for Duke, who are some of those young guys who could uh, come in right off the bat and make an impact? Man, I'm just going to speak up right quick and say this. I can't believe that Clemson and Duke haven't played since 2000 and only played five times in 17 years. That that so blows my mind. Yeah, that blows my mind. <laughs> I just saw that stat, and it just blew my mind. Go ahead. I just totally interrupted that thought thought process. But No, wait. no, no. And I think, um, I think the freshman could totally make, you know, a plug-and-play impact here. Maybe even later on in the game, maybe, you know, the older guys, Tyler Davis, like you said, um, Ruka Roro, Justin Maskell, maybe they need a bit of a break. And then you see guys like, you know, TJ Parker, guys that, you know, could 
definitely make an impact off the cut. Maybe even you could take a look on the offensive side. I know that Tyler Brown has turned heads. He can, you know, be a plug and play if Bo Collins, Antonio Williams, maybe they're on the sideline for a little bit. Same thing with, you know, I know it's a wild card, but you could say the same thing about Jarvis Green. If Don't be surprised if, you know, he makes a carry or two and makes some flashes. So I think that, you know, not all freshmen are going to be guaranteed time bes- uh, besides Peter Woods. I know that he's, I think, believed given the start. But they'll show flashes and they'll show excitement and, you know, they'll show off their talent. And I'm excited to see them because they can make some big plays on a primetime Monday game that everybody will be watching. Yeah, and Scott, who are some of those young guys for Duke that, that on the other side of things could uh, could make a splash come Monday? Well, um, they don't. The depth chart really doesn't have maybe freshmen getting the impact. Impact. There is a safety that transferred over from running back Terry Moore, who had a really good season last year in the running back room. He actually transferred over to play safety. Uh, there's a couple a couple offensive weapons possibly at wide receiver. Spencer Jones is one. Uh, Sean Brown is another. And then obviously Peyton Peyton Jones is uh, – I think he's going to be a, a star in the next three years for Duke at running back. And I'm not – I don't want to put it out there and say that I think he's going to have a, a lot of the carries this season, but I do think as the season goes on, he may have more carries than the other guys that are there before him. <clears throat> Yeah, I think so. Um, I'd say that's a pretty good, uh, pretty good chance. And you know, it's just so many intriguing matchups that are across the board. And uh, Clifton, before we get into a little bit of a Q and A here, uh, just to kind of go back and piggyback on what you said that it's uh, uh, Clemson and Duke have only played five times uh, in recent memory. The last of those games came in 2018. That was at Death Valley, a 35 to six Clemson victory. And all-time, Clemson is 37-16 with one tie uh, in the series against Duke. But when I look at this game, at least on paper, and how the matchups stack up, you know, at the end of the day, I I see a game that's probably a lot closer uh, than that 35-6 margin in 2018. And maybe not as a byproduct of Clemson has fallen off or what any of the other national pundits would like you to believe or, or, or would say about it, but simply because Duke has done a great job of building their program up, putting guys in place that can contribute and make plays. And, and as Duke has gotten better as a program, and for that reason, I, I certainly don't see the, the margin being that wide this time. No, not no. at all. And I think – you're going to see a very close game. I think experienced teams do not lose, especially at home on national TV. And you're going to see that. And this game will stay close for a good bit, in my honest opinion. I think that it could be maybe a little bit too close to call, uh, maybe too close for comfort for Clemson fans. But, you know, this Duke, this Duke team is no joke. I think it's the perfect opener, uh, an experienced team that could give the Tigers a, a true test. And I'm all for it. I'm very, very excited for this game. It's one of the ones that I've had pinned on my on my wall for a little bit. And I'm just a, overall just excited to see how it runs and how it goes. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think, you know, Duke's gotten better over the last few years. And um, they're really uh, – they're, they've got some good guys on, on their team and everything. And um, – but, you know, I think Clemson has something to prove as well. And um, because of the national media and what they're what they're saying about them and stuff like that, so um, it's going to be close, I think, in maybe the first half. But as the game goes on, I think that I've heard again. I've heard a lot about our offensive line, um, and I think if our if our offense could could wear the defense down, then I, it it might get away in the second half, but. You never know. I mean, these first games, you never know what to expect or anything like that. So it's it's really up in the air until we, that ball snapped at 8 o'clock on Monday night. So, Well, I would say that, um, you know, if, you, if you're looking at the game and just, if you're just a, a fan of football, if you think about it on paper, you see that you've basically – you've given Mike Elko, one of the best defensive coordinators in the world – an opportunity to watch the Garrett Riley system and knowing that this is really the first test per se 
that's a great matchup. But you flip that around the same way. Garrett Riley, with the system that he has, I think I'll say this because I'm not saying this because I'm on a Clemson podcast. I think the weapons are better at Clemson than they were at TCU. That's just a personal opinion. And yep. I mean, you're, you're the, the athletes are better. So that running that system is going to be very good. And I think obviously you guys are going to be very happy at the end of the day. Well, and again, I think it's um, it, certainly Clemson's going to get Duke's best shot again. Home opener, prime time, ESPN, Labor Day Monday night, and it's the last show in town. It, it, it's the prime time after all the matinees and Saturday and Sunday. And so all eyes are going to be on Wallace Wade Stadium uh, on Monday night. And, and I just – I fully expect it to be a terrific game. So, you know, as we get ready to wrap it up here uh, for this episode, um, you know, I think let's do a little rapid fire and some Q&A uh, back and forth with this game and – uh, Scott, uh, you, you know, I think uh, all of us probably have a couple of questions for you about Duke. So, um, you know, uh, let's fire a couple your way. And uh, then we've got some questions here from um, some guys over at Duke and from you as well. And we'll try to answer those as best that we can. But uh, Griffin, uh, I'll kick it to you first. Um, uh, what, what would you like to know about Monday's game? Yeah, and um, my question for you, Scott, and I know that you've talked a good bit about this Duke team, just how about how resilient and how experienced they are. But, you know, is there anything else that comes with this team that maybe, you know, any fan, especially, you know, Clemson fans might not know going into Monday night about this team? I, w- I would say that uh, since Coach Elko has come in, uh, especially last season would be a prime example of how things have gone there would be times where Duke would be struggling in the third and fourth quarter where in years past they would have laid there and take, taken the butt whooping. This last past season, they stared that thing right down and they went and fought. And some of those games they brought home, a couple of them they were not able to win. So to me, it three years ago, we'd have been worried as I'll get out about playing Clemson. Now knowing that the way the players are, the infrastructure is and everything, Duke is not. I don't think Duke will be scared of Clemson, if that if that makes sense. Where you know a lot of people would think, well, you know, Duke, they're Duke, but no, they're going to look at Clemson eye to eye. And I, I mean, the better team's going to win at the end of the day anyway. We all know that. Yeah. But I think it's going to be a great matchup between two teams that I really think both sides believe they're going into this with a chance to win. Yeah. yeah. Clemson, uh, uh, you know, you know, from your end, what would you like to know? Well, I so I know you've kind of talked about this with the transfers and everything y'all have gotten and everything. How how do you think um, those transfers, along with you know the back end of that defense, is going to handle our wide receivers? And well, in okay, in theory, you would think that um, like Al Blades from Miami and Miles Jones from A and M would have seen guys that size mm-hmm. or similar to it in their careers. Uh, Jeremiah Lewis, maybe the same thing, but he, he played safety more than he did anything. Um, and to be honest with you, Cam Dillon, the, I, to my opinion, the number one linebacker, he's a transfer also. This is his last season. So I think there's you know, the matchup is going to be interesting. I think that's one of the things, if you're on the couch watching it, that's one of the things you want to see. You want to see how Duke plays against that offense and how they match up against the receivers, and especially the tight end, in my opinion. I mean, obviously, because you know you're going to run the football. And the other side to me would be uh, the Cabe Kludnick part of the whole deal. Does he run? Does he throw? Is somebody going to spy? I mean, all those things are things that we'll have to wonder about until eight fifteen, probably Monday night, to see what actually happens. Yeah. Yep. And my question would be, what was the genesis uh, for the turnaround for Duke football? And going back prior to the start of this season, as a program, where did you start to see it turn around? What was the turning point, and what was the catalyst that kind of brought it from where it was to where it is now? I think in the last five years, well, we'll say before last year, in the last four to five years, Duke had gone to where they were back in in the deal. I mean, they were getting these big name, 
players and things like that. People were getting drafted. And they just started having times where we'd get in the middle of the third quarter and it seemed like there was no nothing being changed at halftime. And now with Coach Elko, uh, the, the coordinators he's brought in, he's brought in a great mindset. And one of the guys in – nationally he probably will not get a lot of pub but we know here david feely the strength and conditioning coach is the man he has turned these boys into men there graham barton is a great example of where his body has changed in the two years that he's been here on campus to where graham was a big boy but now graham is a first round draft pick big boy and that's one of the things these guys have bought into it. They The strength and conditioning part has been great. Coach Elko has done a great job with these guys. And I think, you know, obviously Duke, Duke is an attractive place. I mean, if you have a Duke degree, you can go make some money at something someday. But for these football players, it's really a good opportunity. And, and like I say, the, the, the atmosphere, the, the fan base has changed completely. There's sometimes in some ways it almost feels like at times that the football is a little more exciting than the basketball, which was what kind of we kind of, we're, we're big Duke fans. Obviously we grew up Duke fans and we won't talk about the round ball on our podcast at all. We tried to stay away from it, but there are a lot of people who now would rather just watch Duke football. And it's crazy. I know that sounds crazy, but it's the truth. Well, uh, we certainly appreciate that insight into Duke. And uh, conversely, we've got a few questions, <clears throat> excuse me, that were posed to us uh, regarding Clemson and how things are going with the Tigers. So uh, we've got three questions here, and um, I'm just going to go, Griffin, I'll let you handle the first. Uh, Cliff can take the second, then I'll bring up the rear on this one. But uh, the first question from Peter Dodge, and he would like to know, has Clemson improved their pass rush? So, uh, Griffin, uh, what do you think on that end and how have the Tigers improved in that area? I think just based off health, I think you're getting guys, like I said, Xavier Thomas, Justin Maskell, you're returning guys, Tyler Davis, Rook Arroyo, and you're bringing in fresh Peter Woods. So, honestly, I think it's just a huge melting pot of success, in my opinion. And not only that, that you're just going to have incredible depth. Like I said, these freshmen that – these freshmen – that are showing flashes of talent, I think you're going to see that. So to answer that question, yes, I do think so. I think I do think so just because of injuries and people coming back and, you know, people foregoing the draft. And you're going to see that on Monday. I think you'll see, you know, these flashes of talent and the explosiveness. I'm, I'm ready for it. I'm really excited to see what this defensive line can do. And uh, Clifton, our next question comes from Garrett Robertson. And he wants to know, with new offensive coordinator Garrett Riley uh, coming in and establishing uh, the, a new offense for Clemson, how similar uh, or uh, what are the similarities that we'll see between what he ran at TCU and with Clemson? Will it be the same, or do you expect any type of wrinkles that are uh, that differentiate from what he did with TCU? Yeah, I do think um, you'll see a lot of the same stuff, but I'll, I, um, you'll also see some some different wrinkles, like. Um, I know Dabo said that they um, they really want to use the tight ends, and and again, I didn't really watch a lot of the um, a lot of the TCU film, but um, but I know that we can stick that tight end out there at wide receiver if we want to, um, and I do think that um, that you will see some wrinkles, maybe um, maybe from the wide receivers or the running backs or but I really think that tight end is going to be a big key to getting this offense going just because he's so big and and um, versatile and can do all types of different things. So, yeah, I do think you will see some wrinkles, but I also think you'll see the same thing. Yeah, for sure. And the last question, Scott, this was your question. Um, and is there a current or old school one-two punch at running back that uh, is comparable or reminds you of Shipley and Moffa? And, um, you know, Griffin and Clifton, they touched on this a little bit earlier, so uh, there's not too, too much I can add to it. But uh, quite simply, uh, Davis and C.J. Spiller, back in the day, it was lightning and thunder. 
Um, you had Spiller, who's just the guy. He's a, he's the barn burner. He's the game breaker. He can take it to the house anywhere, anytime. And then you had Davis, who was just a big bullish running back who could run over you. So, um, yeah, I think Shipley's probably the closer comparison to Spiller. Uh, he's versatile like CJ was. And then you've got Moffa, who's the change of pace guy, who is just that big bowling ball uh, that can run over you, who can churn out yards and really grind down a defense. And so, you know, I don't think I have to uh, – can probably speak for most Clemson fans. We don't have to look too, too far in the past, about 15 years, to find that comparison. And it's the closest thing the Tigers have had to that combo uh, since the Davis Spiller tandem. Yeah. And I got one more. I got yeah, one go more for question for you, um, Scott. Um, I know in the past, um, you know, Duke hasn't been able to fill that stadium, or at least it's been tough. I feel like. Yes. Um, do you feel like with Mike Elko and um, and what happened last year? I don't know with Mike Elko, like how much y'all filled up the stadium, but with this being the only game on TV. I would think the answer would be yes, it's going to be full. So so what do you think? Well, that's uh, that's a very good question. Um, honestly, I'm not 100% sure it's going to be full. And that sounds bad. Uh, you know, I, I just don't understand Duke fans. And that's a plea that we try to make on a weekly basis to folks. And, hey, I'll make the plea on your, in your podcast. Folks, if you're Clemson fans and you want tickets and want to drive up 85, Come on, we'll have room for you, I'm sure. But honestly, when you get to the big games, obviously, I think there will be. It could be sixty forty. I think maybe Duke to Clemson. Uh, further down the road, we play Notre Dame again at the end of the month. It'll be about the same, and then we play NC State two weeks later. And NC State will travel anywhere with everybody. They don't care who's playing. They don't care how bad they are. They fill up a joint. So as far as that's concerned, the the Carolina game last year. I'm sorry, Chapel Hill College game last year. Um, when we played them, there was a pretty good crowd, and it was about it was about 60, 40 Duke. And I think it was probably the – that's one of the few times that the stadium will feel. And that's one of the things we're working on. I mean, we're trying our best as the four guys that we are. We're trying to get the fan base into it. And th there's actually something worth watching finally. I mean, Coach mm -hmm. Cut was great. We love Coach Cut. But these athletes are better now than they were three years ago. And these these guys, are they deserve to have people sit there and cheer for them and watch the games. And that's what Duke needs to do. And the, the, the atmosphere has changed. The game day stuff has changed. We're getting there. It's slow. I mean, it's Duke is a hard place to change. Yeah. And they're setting their feet about a lot of things. And it's, it, I mean, it's not a bad thing. That's fine. But as far as Duke football, it's definitely something that we, on a weekly basis, beg, plead. Man, we, we, we want to see the play for the kids. I mean, these 22, 18 to 22-year-old guys are out here working their backsides off. It would be nice to have somebody up there cheering for them that's not their family. So yeah. so to answer your question, right. I'm not 100% sure it's going to be full because there's still a lot of tickets available on the secondary markets. I'm hoping that people just realize, hey, it's going to be a decent night. Take the next day off of work. Don't worry about working on Tuesday and drive on up and come hang out. We we had decided that, and it's kind of a joke. I, I'll, I'll tell you this joke and hope it's okay. Um, we joked at the end of the podcast last night when we did ours that if Duke happens to win, that pretty much you party, enjoy yourself, have a great time, and you just sleep wherever you stop. So if it's <laughs> on the 50-yard line, you just lay on the 50-yard line and take your nap for a couple hours. It is what it is because if yeah. Duke wins, I mean, it's going to be a big thing. That's yeah, right. absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, well, as uh, we're going to wrap it up for this episode of Around the Paul, but before we do, rapid fire 30 seconds or less from everybody, uh, starting with Griffin. Or, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll start with Griffin on this. We'll work our way back around to me, but uh, 30 seconds or less, rapid fire. X Factor for Monday night. What has to happen? I mean, I. I already mentioned his name, but Jake Brenningstool, I think, you know, with maybe a shorter Duke secondary, if you get Brenningstool up in this match, I think that he's going to have a great game. Kate Klubnik will have a great game, and I think, you know, they'll hopefully the Tigers win. Yep, I'm going to say my X-Factor is going to be the young wide receivers. 
um, and see which one of those guys we can get on the field. Um, and, you know, Tyler Brown or maybe um, Tink, you know, and uh, maybe we can get one of them two guys on the field and see what they can do along with Noble. I mean, that's just the young wide receivers because um, I'm not really worried about the defense. So that's kind of where I'm at. I would say the Duke defensive line trying to touch Cabe Clubding because if he stands up there and doesn't have a grass stain on his jersey, it is going to be a long night for the Duke defense. And that actually uh, goes seeds right into mine. Cade Klubnik, uh, to me, hands down. Uh, this is his first game as the undisputed QB1. He's the man right out of the gate. And I think it's imperative to, to, to have some quick hitters early and to get in, uh, have him some passes that he can complete, put together a couple of good drives in the first quarter, and make sure that that confidence level is high right from the get-go. And I think if he does that, it could be a good night for Clemson and uh, the school guys around him. But at the end of the day, football season is here. We're looking forward to it. And, uh, you know, it's uh, as we like to say here, it's a great day to be a Clemson Tiger. But with the way that Duke football is going for you guys as well, it's a great time to be a Duke Blue Devil. I agree. I agree. This is this is one of the best times, in my opinion, to be a Blue Devil. So. Yeah, absolutely. Well, well, uh, we'll let our viewers know uh, we'll have another guest on next week and we will be happy to welcome Jake Crane from the Daily Wire, who will be joining us next week. And we're looking forward to having Jake and all of his valuable insight as well. But for tonight, Scott Medlin from DukeFootballTalk.com from the Section 17 podcast. Thank you so much for joining us here on Around Thanks, the Ball. Man. Appreciate it. Yeah, providing your insights. Thank you so much. Duke. It was a pleasure having you. Yeah, appreciate it, guys. And, hey, good luck the rest of the season after Monday night. Absolutely. <laughs> and and right likewise, back you. Right back you. It was well. It was well. That's, well. well, that's going to well. do it for us tonight. Uh, we hope you've enjoyed the episode. And now the countdown begins to Monday night kickoff uh, scheduled for around 8.15 p.m. Wallace Wade Stadium in Durham, North Carolina. And uh, we'll see everybody on the flip side after what we hope is a Clemson win and after what Scott and uh, everybody in Durham hopes is a Duke win. So we'll see how it shakes out. But yeah, until next time, I'm Garrett Mitchell for Griffin Barfield, Clifton Kennedy, and our guest tonight, Scott Medlin. So long, everyone. Yep. Go Tigers. Go Tigers. Go Tigers.